Hi there, my name is Ormita Satori. I'm the head of custom content at telecoms.com. I'm here at Network X in Paris and I'm joined by Sylvia Kishish from UCLA. Hi Sylvia. Hi Ormita, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, you've just published a um, report recently um, and would you like to just kick off by telling us a little bit about that? Sure, for sure. Uh, we just published a report. I'm just checking to make sure I give you the full proper title. Oh. Uh, looks at the reality check on the progress towards a gigabit society. So European Commission has quite lofty goals when it comes to gigabit society. So at least 100 megabits per second uh, household enterprises coverage by 2025 and gigabit access mm -hmm. by 2030. So that's quite quite aggressive target. And what we have done, we've looked at the actual speeds that our users are getting. So for instance, when it comes to gigabit per second um, subscription, so what people are subscribing to versus what they're getting, there's a massive gap. Mm -hmm. So for example, we're here in France. So in France, almost 40% of households have access to at least one gigabit per second um, broadband. Mm -hmm. But when we look at our data, it turns out that just over 1% and below 2% of our speakers' users are actually experiencing such speeds. So there is a big gap in between what we see in terms of being sold versus what the users are experiencing. The gap is not as big when it comes to 100 megabits per second, but for sure when it comes to gigabits, there, there is a gap. And one of the reasons for that is fiber rollout. And so across a lot of countries, there's quite a lot of targets. We're seeing a lot of homes being passed in terms of coverage being there, but that this doesn't necessarily translate into take up. So even though you might be within the coverage, you're not going to buy it. Multiple reasons, again, you might not want it, you, you, you don't care, or you think you have fiber already. So that's some things that, we, that we're seeing and looking at. And that's obviously important because you want to make sure you have a good quality of experience and actually you, you, you get what, what, what you're paying for. So, so that's something that we have found out. That's obviously fixed network performance. That's, it's, it's, it's improving, but it's not uh, still amazing to the, to the cost that we expect it to be. Okay, interesting. Um, this is good to know. And as you said, so one of the targets of the Gigabit Society is related to fixed broadband, and another one is related to 5G coverage. Um, that is coverage to all urban areas by 2025. So what does UCLA see um, when it comes to 5G performance? This is a really interesting question because we see performance really varies. And it's not only across Europe, and, but also across the board. So earlier this year, we have published a report looking at the relationship between spectrum mm -hmm. and 5G performance. So when it comes to spectrum, without keeping it very long, uh, we have three different spectrum bands, the 5G spectrum bands as it pertains to, um, to, to, to 5G. We have the low low band, so 700, under one gigabits per second. We have the, the C bands, the so-called the, the, the sweet spot <laughs> you remember from back in the day. So, and then we have the millimeter wave. So obviously millimeter wave, super fast speeds. Uh, we see it being deployed in a few countries, US being one, you really get the over one gigabit per second performance. Uh, but again, this comes with the, um, with the issue that it's very, very narrow coverage. And, and it does cost quite a bit to, to, to roll out and you have to densify the networks a bit. Then you go to the C band. And really C band, we see the countries that have a large chunk and at least 100 megahertz of a contiguous spectrum mm -hmm. that they have signed to operate is, they tend to perform better. So this for sure has a very good impact on performance. But then when it comes to the low bands, that really helps with the coverage. So for instance, KP in the Netherlands, the first started with a low band because they wanted to ensure coverage um, of, of the 5G, 5G network, and then they only got um, uh, C band spectrum. So we have actually looked at 5G markets and 5G operators and broke them into four different groups. 5G leaders, those that are getting over 300 megabits per second. So you, you think about South Korea, uh, you think even Malaysia now with a really unique deployment that they have, uh, they're now in, in the, in the lead, lead when it comes to 5G performance and, and some of the, um, Gulf countries. Uh, then 5G high performers. So between 200 to 300 megabits per second. So these are the markets that they have good amount of spectrum, uh, good good uh, competition, um, and they will quite often use a bit of dynamic spectrum sharing to help them a little bit uh, with with 5G. 
and we have 5G improvers. So those under 200 megabits per second, so majority of, of, of Europe falls within, within 5G that. improvers. Uh, so we have the, the likes of the UK and, and so on in there. And then 5G outliers. So you have a few countries that don't perform well under 100 megabits per second. And that's, you have Poland in there that just started uh, auction for 5G. So obviously very late to the yeah. game. They're yeah. mostly using dynamic spectrum sharing for, for, for 5G. So we see a really mixed bag, but it's not only about performance. It's also, you know, you have to make sure you have good use cases 5G. So we still, we see a massive gap between 4G and 5G. 5G definitely per performance is better but not, not as good as we would have expected at, at the beginning. Yes, no, absolutely. There was a, there was a panel I was listening to earlier today uh, where somebody on the stage said there is a bit of 5G soul searching yes, going on at the moment when it comes to the um, use cases. But um, okay, so we talked about the fixed um, side of things. We talked about 5G performance and um, universal coverage and that connecting everyone is um, obviously really important. So what is from an access technology perspective, um, what is the best way in your view to connect everyone? And this actually goes back to use cases because what we see is obviously strong targets for fiber rollout, but quite often fiber, it's not economically viable in certain areas. So. Um, a large amount of money is being made available to roll out fiber to, to even to white, white spots areas. So there is no coverage in there. But quite often, we need to think about the best technology that suits that need. So this could be satellite. I mean, we've all heard about Starlink success and Starlink connecting previously unconnected areas. And based on our data, we see that Starlink has really high uh, net promoter score simply because people that previously didn't have broadband, now they have broadband, they're super happy, right? So that's that's kind of no-brainer. But we see so either satellite, but also we see 5G based fixed wireless access stepping in, and there's lots of excitement. So probably walking around the halls or listening to some of the talks, everybody's excited about fixed wireless access. And this is now the killer use case for 5G. So we, we've come to the stage when actually 5G fixed wireless access is really important, and there's lots of conversation was the best more, more uh, the best way to deliver it. And we see, for instance, in, in the US, uh, T-Mobile is already delivering quite, quite those good speeds when it comes to fixed wireless access. And we see a lot of operators also in Asia, um, in, in Australia, they really look to connect the unconnected, so the, the kind of last mile connecting BT using um, fixed wireless access. So yes, it is, this could be satellite, this could be FWA, but it really depends what makes most economical sales. Super, lovely catching up with you, Thank Sylvia. you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Armita.